Patricia, we are recording. Everyone else, good morning. Welcome to the launch of our new resource, Ready for Real Life. Um, if you don't know anything about well, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Cam Turner. I'm the research coordinator here at Growing Leaders. Um, if you're not familiar with what we do here at GL, we are an Atlanta-based nonprofit with a mission of empowering the emerging generation with the skills they, lead, they need to lead to with the skills they need to lead in real life. We partner with people like you to provide practical resources like this new book on issues that you see around your campus. Um, you know, we're super excited for this launch. Um, Andrew is my boss. I've got a ton of great things to say about him, not just because he's my boss, but because I actually want to say about him. Um, and one of our core values here at Growing Leaders is turning up the fun. And just because we're in a virtual space today does not mean that we are not going to honor that. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in and get started with a game. The way this game is going to work, it is called Because I Said So. So we provide resources that we provide advice and when your mother, back in the day, when your mother would give you advice, you, you, you wonder if those things are true or false, right? So this is the way this is gonna work. I'm gonna put a statement on the board. You see the truth -o meter on the bottom and it's gonna be ranked from one to five. So we see everybody using the chat. So you're gonna type in either one, two, three, four or five based on how true you believe it is. One being the least amount of true, five being true as, what's, what's super true? 100% true. true versus 0% true. One through five, use the chat. Here is our first question. Remember when your mother used to say, no swimming for an hour after lunch, you'll cramp up. Is this one, not true at all, or five, super true? Type in your answers in the chat. We got a lot of ones coming in, twos, threes, zeros. <laughs> zeros not on the scale, sir. <laughs> All right, the correct answer is completely false. Now you may be wondering, but so there's actual, so think about a, a triathlon swimmer. When they're swimming those long distances, they'll actually stop for a minute, tread their water and eat while they're swimming. So it's not true. You will not get a cramp when you're swimming. You can eat actually while you're in the act of doing it. Next question, next statement, I should say. Do, don't run with scissors. Is this one, not true, or five, super true? <laughs> we got a bunch of fives coming in, a bunch of fours, some threes. All right, you guys got it. It is a four. Now, scissors can certainly injure you, so it's super true. However, there are some more dangerous things you should worry about. About 4,556 injuries that have happened, but there are only some things that are more dangerous. In the same year, these were the things that were more dangerous. So batteries had nearly 4,972 injuries, banisters, 9,434 injuries, benches at 11,000, and coins coming in as the top most dangerous object at 28,674 injuries. So at the end of the day, coins are more dangerous than your scissors. Learn something new every day. Next one, don't step on a rusty nail, you'll get tetanus. One, not true at all, five, 100% true. Somebody put an eight in there. They're like, yeah, you're gonna get tetanus. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the correct answer is about a two. So yes, you can get tetanus, but it's not about the nail or the rust, but it's from the open wound. A rusty nail itself will not call it. Next question, close the door. You trying to heat the whole neighborhood? My mother used to tell me this all the time. If you remember that one, is this super true or super false? You decide, one to three. Two, three, four, one, 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 three. All right, so completely true. So there was a study done that they took, I think it was through a 50-day period. Every day they, they counted the number of, excuse me, Every day they opened the door, they had the heat on in the winter, they opened the door and then they calculated the amount of energy that is spent when the door was open versus when the door was closed. The energy bill nearly cut in half when it was closed rather than when it was open. So yes, if you leave the door open in the summer, you cool in the whole neighborhood, you lend the AC out in the winter, you're, you're heating the whole neighborhood and you're gonna cut your bill in half. 
<laughs> Next question. If you crack your knuckles, you'll get arthritis. My mother used to tell me this all the time. Is this super true or super false? You decide. Lots of ones coming in. Sue, sue, sue. All right. Seems like y'all got this one completely false. So fun story behind this. For about 50 years, a man named Donald Unger was the first one to take this study on hand, quite literally. He took the, the knuckles on his left hand, but not his right. So for 50 years, every day, he would crack his knuckles to see if he would develop arthritis in one hand versus the other. The result, no changes at all. At an award ceremony, a, a celebrating his achievement for his study, um, he, he cried out, mother, you were wrong. So at the end of the day, sometimes your mother's right. Sometimes she's not. But at the end of the day, they always give you what you need to be ready for real life. So without further ado, we are going to launch this new resource. Um, this man is one of my favorite people in the world. Not only is he my boss, but he is my friend. So I have nothing but good words for him. He is a brilliant man. I call him the professor. Please welcome Dr. Not yet, Andrew <laughs> McPeak. Thank you, Cam. Thank you. Uh, let's give it up for Cam, too. That was a whole lot of fun, what he just led us through. So uh, thank you guys so much for jumping into that. Um, so I want to talk through what we're going to be doing today. First of all, I want to just say thank you guys so much for hopping on. There's an amazing 95 people uh, who are on right now. Um, this is for me, it's the culmination of a really long journey. Um, I got the idea for this book back in early 2021, and here we are in 2023 talking about it, and it's really cool to work towards something for a long time and see it come to life. But the, the sort of heart behind why I really got into this is I kept running into so many adults who are experiencing challenges with how to lead kids. They knew that they needed to pass on some really important skills, but just like we saw in that game we just played, a lot of times we give advice, but we're not actually stopping and asking, is the advice I gave really actually good? Uh, and that's really, that was kind of the heart of this resource when I uh, began working on it uh, over two years ago. So um, the, in the end, what we ended up calling this resource was Ready for Real Life. I don't know if you've seen the cover yet, uh, but this is what it looks like, Ready for Real Life, unpacking the five essential soft skills great leaders instill in their students. I've heard a lot of people talk about different soft skills, SEL, character education, career readiness. Uh, we got to make sure they've got um, employability skills and all these different things, life skills, leadership skills. And what I found actually when you investigate all of that stuff is that every one of those topics, even though they seem like they're all different things, actually come back to the same five core skills. And that's what this book is all about, both what are they? Why do we need them? And also how do we actually give these skills to our students? And what I did is I broke each of these skills down in a very growing leader's way to five core metaphors that can help us explain what these skills are as well as how we actually pass them on to, to our students. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. So uh, as it says on the screen, this resource is gonna go live April 18th. That's when it's gonna ship. The pre-order for this is gonna launch in the very near future. I'm gonna give you information about how to stay in touch with us so that you know when that pre-order launches. And then uh, like we said, it's going to ship on April 18th. You're gonna get it in your hands and hopefully uh, it's gonna be a help helpful uh, resource for you. As I was beginning working on uh, this resource, I came across the story of a young woman. Uh, it's a girl by the name of Hazel Miner. She was five or 15 years old, rather, uh, back in 1920, back in 1920. Um, and she was in North Dakota. That's where she lived with her family. And Hazel experienced a tragedy. Hazel was with her two younger siblings, Emmett and Meredith, and they were leaving school because school had let out early. There was a blizzard that was on its way. And as they were heading away from school, their horse got spooked and took off and actually took them and their sleigh off into the countryside just as the blizzard was hitting. Well, um, so um, imagine it kind of looks like this. And I don't know if you've ever been in conditions like this, but they can actually be scary and things can change really, really quickly. So that's exactly what happened to them. They are off into the wilderness. Uh, her father and all the local um, community members find out that she has been, uh, she has disappeared into this, uh, um, uh, these conditions. And so uh, they chase off after the, the kids, but they can't find them. And the conditions are getting so worse and so much worse and worse and worse that they eventually have to head back home for their own safety. 
and they head out back the next day and they finally find the kids. It's been 25 hours since they were originally lost that they find them. And what had happened is the sleigh had turned over pretty quickly after uh, the horse had gotten spooked and took off. And so the snow had covered over top of the sleigh and Hazel decided that she was going to do everything she could to protect her two younger siblings. And so at 15 years old, she took every blanket they had, every uh, resource they had inside of that sleigh and covered her two younger siblings with it to keep them warm. And then as her final act of heroism, she opened her own coat up and put it over top of them and then laid over top of them herself in order to keep them warm. And so when they finally found Hazel, she had actually passed away, and but her two siblings remarkably were still alive. Her sacrifice actually uh, kept them alive. It was an amazing story of heroism that in 1920, it went viral, actually, so they didn't have internet back then, but literally newspapers all over the country and even around the world picked up this story, uh, talking about this young 15-year-old girl who had sacrificed herself to save her siblings. Now, I love uh, stories of heroism like this. I'm always amazed at what young people can do. But the question I was left with after I first heard this story is, why was this heroism so necessary? Why was it that when she got lost into these conditions that nobody was able to find her? Well, there's actually a name for the conditions she was stuck in. They're often called whiteout conditions. It's that uh, uh, situation you're in. And I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, especially while driving or any other uh, thing. Some of you are probably from northern areas where you get a lot of snow, but it's when the blizzard comes and the winds are so strong and the snow is so strong, uh, the, the everything is sort of uh, coming down on you and you can't see in front of your face. Maybe you've been in a situation like this with fog. That can certainly happen in the same way, but it's basically like you can't see about five feet in front of you. And the remarkable thing about whiteout conditions is that uh, what happens is they make territory that was previously familiar all of a sudden foreign. Because if you think about it, uh, Hazel, her two younger siblings, as well as her father and all of those community members, they lived in the area where they were searching. They were from that area, right? But the very area that they could have navigated on any normal day without any issues whatsoever, all of a sudden became foreign. It was like they were all of a sudden in a totally different place. And the, the thing that I became sort of convinced of is two things. One, uh, we are experiencing, I think, in many ways, both as adults and students, we're experiencing whiteout conditions today. And this is why talking about how do we get students ready for real life is so important, because not only are we experiencing whiteout conditions, but I think we're seeing signs that our students are completely unprepared for the world they're entering into right now. A world of challenges, of confusion, of frustration. As I was working on this, uh, sort of the opening to the book, I, I began to think about what are the realities causing whiteout conditions today? Can I give you a few that I thought of? I think these are some of the whiteout conditions that we as their leaders and their teachers, their coaches, their parents are facing today. So obviously the first uh, uh, easy example here is that one of the whiteout conditions we face is a global pandemic, right? Everything we thought we knew all of a sudden got changed almost overnight. It felt like one weekend and all of a sudden everything's different. And if you felt like you were leading really well, and then all of a sudden you felt like you were not leading very well, all because of this, that's exactly what happened, right? The conditions uh, got so worse or so much uh, worse that you actually find yourself in a rough situation. Another one is rapidly changing technology and social media. I hear parents and leaders talk about this all the time. I felt like I really understood how to connect with students and then TikTok came along and all of a sudden I feel lost. Um, there's political polarization, right? Where once we felt like we understood how to talk about matters of civil uh, issues or politics or whatever it was, all of a sudden it feels like this climate is not even allowing for conversation anymore. I used to feel like I was familiar and I knew how to navigate it, how it just feels foreign and I'm not sure. Another one is declining, uh, declining parenting skills. I hear this all over the place I go, or all over the place when I uh, visit different schools and uh, different communities. In fact, I met an educator several years ago. She was in her 25th year of education. I just happened to ask her, and I'll never forget this conversation because of her answer. I said, uh, in, in the last 25 years, what would you say has changed the most? Of course, I was expecting her to answer, well, once kids got those smart devices, it changed everything. That was not her answer. Her answer was the thing that has changed the most in my 25 years of, of teaching is the parents, not the kids. 
Do parents have fewer skills that they need in order to get their kids ready? And often what they expect is some sort of, the metaphor we use is often dry cleaner parenting, right? Whenever you need your shirt dry cleaned, you take it to the professional, let them do it, and then you go and pick it up. That's the way a lot of parents feel like uh, or, or act like uh, around educators or pastors or anybody. It's like, those are the professionals who know how to handle my kids. So I'm going to drop my kids off with them and pick them up. And by the way, if I don't like how they turned out, I'm going to go back and complain. A uh, couple more. Uh, we're seeing shifting priorities of school. So even once it feels like you figure things out, maybe as an educator, somebody comes along and all of a sudden there's a new policy or a new expectation or a new curriculum or a new course. And all of a sudden you uh, feel like you're starting from scratch all because of a decision made by somebody who's never even visited your classroom, never even maybe visited your school. And of course, the big one, the one that we talk about at Growing Leaders all the time, generation gaps. I felt like I understood those millennials and now all of a sudden Generation Z is here. Or if you're a, 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 an educator in an elementary school, you felt like you were understanding Generation Z and now the alphas are starting to appear in our schools. Uh, these gaps can make it feel like what was once, again, what was once familiar all of a sudden has become foreign. For our kids today, I think uh, what has happened is that a lot of us are, are realizing that kids are facing situations or conditions that we didn't actually expect. There's many realities in our world today. I want to talk about seven of them. And with each of those realities, I think that there was an intended bright side. And what sort of came, uh, came up on us, it sort of snuck up on us, the rug got pulled out from under us, is that while we had an intended bright side to that thing we offered our students, what's actually ended up happening is that a lot of times the dark side has come out. And often the dark side happens when we use that thing un wisely, unwisely. So think about a few of these realities causing whiteout conditions for our students today. First, there is technology, right? At its core, technology was designed to give us instant access, wasn't it? Uh, by instant access, I mean two-day shipping from Amazon. Some of you are getting shipping even faster than that, right? I want this thing and I get it now. Or it's our drive through lanes um, for our fast food restaurants, right? There's two or even three lines helping us get what we want even faster. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with instant access. It's actually a really great thing that technology has brought to our world. But when I get so used to instant access that I, uh, I'm less and less patient, what can happen is that instant access becomes instant gratification, doesn't it, right? I can't live without getting things immediately when I want them. And all of a sudden we start to use words like entitlement, right? Entitlement is the after effect of growing up in a world and believing that, that the speed you experience online is what's supposed to happen everywhere else. Another one is social media, of course. Social media at its, whole, at its core, what it was designed to do is make a world that was more connected and more inclusive, more people at the table, more people connecting with one another. And indeed, that's how it started, isn't it? But as time has gone on, as we've spent more and more and more of our days on social media, kids are reporting not feeling connected and inclusive. Instead, the language they use is, I feel anxious and I feel alone which is exactly the opposite of what social media was originally intended to do. What about opportunity? We're giving our kids more opportunity than any generation ever before. The devices they have in their hands, the resumes that they're, uh, that they're building, even as young as middle school and high school, they're quite remarkable, which means that today's kids are more involved than other generations. They have more stuff on their resume, more things they do. Most kids today have a Google calendar that's managed by a parent who's helping them kind of keep organized with all the stuff they have going on. But if we're being honest, and if we really think about it, the more stuff I'm involved in, the less engaged I become in all of those things, right? And I don't know about you, but I've seen a whole lot of students who just feel like they're sort of floating between stuff and they're not really committed to any one thing. We always say they're very involved. They don't seem to be very committed. That's an after effect, I think, of a world full of opportunities. What about screens? Can you imagine going through the pandemic we just went through without our screens? That would have been very, very rough, right? And, and at its best, and the pandemic's a great example of this, screens were designed to open the world to our students, right? All of a sudden, what I can't access comes to me. There were kids during the pandemic who were um, um, you know, visiting digital aquariums. They were uh, touring museums. They were seeing sites all around the world. And that was a really great thing. But if you're around a kid with their screen today, you know that it's not just opening the world to them, it's also closing them off from the world, isn't it? 
because that device becomes a literal barrier that they use rather than connecting with the people around them. That screen that was meant to bring the world to them instead closes them off from the very people who are right next to them. This was just for fun, but what about memes, right? We're growing up in a meme culture today. Every time something comes out, there's got to be a joke or a meme that comes out about it. And one of the after effects of this, what it was meant to do is make a generation of kids who are more savvy. And indeed they are, right? Today's kids are funny. They have always got jokes. They're always keeping track of everything that's going on. But in a world full of meme culture, I'm not just savvy. Sometimes I'm actually cynical. And I also see this in kids today too. Because they're growing up in a culture where everything's a joke, they often are making fun of things uh, before things even really get started. And even the things that are meant to be serious all of a sudden get put into a joking category as well. Two more, platforms. We've platformed our kids and that simply means that they have lots of different accounts on which to ex express themselves creatively, right? I've got my YouTube account, my Instagram, my TikTok, all those different things allow me to be more creative than ever before. And indeed, today's kids are super creative. They're inventing all kinds of things and uh, making websites and all of that stuff. And I think that's really fantastic. But if we're being honest, the other thing that's happening when I split my identity between all these different platforms is that I'm not just abounding in creativity, I'm often lacking in integrity. And I'm using the word integrity with the root here. The word integrity comes from the word integer. And if you remember in math class, integer means whole, whole number, right? And so really when we're talking about a lack of integrity, we're talking about a lack of wholeness. I don't have one identity between all these platforms. I have a different identity for each one of these platforms. And what can often happen is I don't feel like I know who I really I'm not am. sure I understand. Siri's talking to me. Sorry about that. The last one here is support. I think we meant well. And what we did is we, as their adults, teachers and leaders and parents and coaches, what we did is we offered these kids more resources than ever before, right? If I have a question, if I have forgotten my lunch money or backpack or permission slip, if I really want that device that my, uh, my best friend has, right, uh, all of those needs are going to be met. Now, what we have to acknowledge is those things aren't necessarily bad, but often we're defining successful parenting, successful leadership as meeting every need my kid has. But here's the great irony. The more resourced our kids are, often the less resourceful they become. Isn't this true, right? The more I give them, the less they learn to give things to themselves. And often what can happen is we create a generation that's a little more risk averse because they've never had the experience of solving their own problems and meeting their own needs. Now, I think those two slides I just went through, both about us as educators and leaders and about them as the generation of kids growing up in the 21st century, to me, they reveal the reality that we're experiencing today, which is we are facing whiteout conditions. We are facing whiteout conditions. Sorry, I've got somebody chatting. Let me make sure we're muted. Um, so um, I want to talk about two, how we actually address this. Uh, what I've realized as we've, um, as I kind of did research for this book, is that there's two big needs that our kids have today. And they're both uh, things that we need to practice as their leaders, okay? So I want to give you two big leadership ideas. These are the things that are going to be most essential for the 21st century. And these two ideas inform the entirety of, of the book itself. So after I go through these two big ideas, I'm going to actually talk about uh, the application of these and what it looks like, especially those five core skills and how we define those. So big idea number one, I think the more I investigate what, how great leaders are practicing around the world, what I realize is that there's a very big difference between those leaders who lead from hope and those leaders who lead from anxiety hope and anxiety. Now, keep in mind, hope and anxiety can start in the same place, right? Both hope and anxiety can acknowledge things are not great right now. Things are pretty rough, right? I'm, here's the truth of it. This is a, a hard season that we're in right now. The difference is what they do with it and how they look towards the future with it. The person filled with hope looks at the rough stuff that we're facing right now and says, we're going to figure this out. In fact, I believe you have what it takes to get through this. That's what the person of hope would say. The person who's leading from anxiety would go, I don't know if you have what it takes. I don't know if we're going to make it. And if I'm being honest, I've met a whole lot of anxiety-based leaders out there in the world today. 
And I understand it. I understand where it comes from. But the reality is great leaders in the 21st century, those who are really getting their kids ready for real life, are ones who, uh, who ultimately share at their core a message of hope, not anxiety. We've got to be able to communicate. I believe you have what it takes. Um, I didn't mention this in the book because it was actually in our last book that Tim and I worked on together, Generation Z Unfiltered. We actually did a, a partnership with Harris Poll. We researched um, the adults who are leading the emerging generations. And what we found is two out of three leaders has a mindset of anxiety, not hope towards the next generation. Two out of three leaders in our survey said, I don't know if these kids are actually going to make it, right? Uh, that message, whether we're uh, completely bold about it or we sort of just keep it to ourselves, it ultimately is going to get through to them. So I would just challenge you to ask this question. What is your leadership style? Are you leading from a base of hope or a base of anxiety? Here's big idea number two. And this is the one that's really going to fuel the, the direction that we're going to go for the rest of our time together today. Big idea, too, is we have to ultimately teach our students to ground themselves, ground themselves. Now, I don't know if you understand this idea of grounded. You might have heard it. I'm not talking about a kid getting in trouble with their parents, uh, but rather you might hear it, it uses the term emotionally grounded, right? It's somebody who knows who they are. They have a solid sense of identity and the whirling and swirling of the world around them cannot affect who they are. They're ultimately, their feet are planted firmly on the ground. I think one of the main mistakes we make in leading kids is, th is thinking that we can do things for them. Ultimately, if our students are actually going to be ready for the world they're entering into, it's going to be, be because not because we were really great. It's going to be because we were really great at getting them ready to lead themselves, to ground themselves. There's actually a metaphor for this. Um, the metaphor is really simple. It's actually just a rope. If you think back to the story of Hazel Miner, of what happened to her, the challenges that she faced, you might ask the question, if I'm somebody who lives in the uh, kind of northern area, the northern country, a place where they get blizzards and lots of snow and occasionally whiteout conditions, how would I actually be prepared for this, like what should Hazel Miner have done? What, what do people do in order to survive whiteout conditions? The answer I think can tell us a lot about what we can do to ground our own selves. And that is that they don't wait for whiteout conditions in order to get ready for whiteout conditions. It's not like they hear whiteout conditions are coming and they're like, quick, get ready for these things because there isn't really a way to, to solve the whiteout conditions after they're already on you. What you have to do is you have to tie a rope before it comes. As farmers from these um, northern areas, especially the rural northern areas, have talked about how they survive whiteout conditions, what they say is as fall is just beginning to turn to winter, they go outside and they tie a rope between the house and the barn, the house and the barn, because they know no matter how bad conditions get, I've still got to make it out to the barn to take care of my animals. They got to be fed and watered and all that kind of stuff. And, but so they know I'm going to have to go out no matter what the conditions are. And so in order to prepare for that, I will tie a rope connected between the two things. So even in the whiteout conditions, even if I can't see two or three feet in front of my face, you know what I can do? I can hold on to that rope. The rope offers a grounding even in the midst of those whiteout conditions. And this is exactly what I think our students need. Students need a rope, something that helps them sort of remain solid and grounded even when things start swirling around, even when conditions that are once, are once felt familiar all of a sudden become foreign. And this is where this idea of soft skills comes from. So you may have heard this term. In fact, you may have heard a lot of different terms uh, for soft skills, uh, but I really think of them as ultimately as the rope that grounds us as we try and navigate life. And if our students are really gonna be ready, if they're actually gonna have uh, that rope, it's going to be because we gave them these five tools. So I'm gonna talk about these five tools in just a minute, but they are quite simply a mirror, a map, a compass, a two-way radio, and a passport. Ultimately soft skills, you can define them a lot of different ways, but this is the way I'm going to define them. Soft skills are the rope that your students can hold on to in order to find their way, even in the, the most dire of whiteout conditions. Soft skills are also the best tool we have to practice less anxious leadership in our schools and classrooms. 
these five essential tools, and this is sort of the secret of the book, these five essential tools are absolutely essential that we pass on to our kids, but guess what? They're also essential for us. Are we utilizing these five tools in our daily interactions in order to ground ourselves? Well, I want to get into these five skills. Before I do, I just want to remind you, some of you were here before we got started, but the way you're going to find out about this resource, it's going to go live very, very soon. The pre-order for the resource is going to go live very, very soon. The way you want to stay updated on the release for this book, as well as other releases that we're going to have, there's going to be lots of great free resources, events, and opportunities coming your way. All you got to do is get out your phone, text the word READY, to the number you see on your screen, 57101. That's how you're gonna stay in touch. And as soon as the pre-order goes live, you're gonna get a text about it and you'll be able to go and pre-order that. Again, that's coming very soon, but the way to find out when it happens is to text this number uh, 57101. All you gotta do is send that word ready. Okay, so I talked about these five skills. Let's get into each one of these, and I'm going to define each of these skills, and then what I thought might be fun is for me to actually walk through each one and tell you a story, because uh, what I did in this book is I wanted to find tons of stories of young people who are actually practicing these skills and show you what it really looks like, so I'll, I'll tell you a few stories today, too, that I, I, I really love these stories. Okay, so the first one I mentioned is actually called, it's a mirror. And a mirror is the skill of self-awareness, the skill of self-awareness. It's how aware we are of ourselves, of what's going on internally. And we'll dig into the, all, each of these individually in just a minute. The second one is a map. A map is the skill of self-management. How well do I direct myself? How well do I stay on course towards my goals? How disciplined am I in my daily practice? And how organized am I in moving towards that daily practice? The next one is a compass. The compass is the skill of responsible decision making. This is one of the hardest ones to really let our kids do. But this one is all about helping students figure out their own direction. Do I have direction, even in those whiteout conditions, just like a compass has directions, no matter what the conditions that you're facing are. This next one is a two-way radio. I love this one. Actually, I love them all, but I really love this one. A two-way radio is the skill of relationship building. We'll talk about the two requirements of communicating on a two-way radio. They're the same two requirements of being a great relationship builder. Uh, it doesn't really matter how well I'm organizing myself. If I can't interact well and communicate well with other people, I'm ultimately going to fail as I get into real life and face some of the challenges of adulthood. And the final one here is a passport. I also really love this one. A passport is a skill of social awareness. How do I recognize who I am in the context of everyone around me? Social awareness is probably the hardest of these skills to communicate to our students, but I think this metaphor of a passport, you're going to really enjoy. Okay, so let's dig into each of these. Let's look at this first one, a mirror. I wonder um, if you've ever done this. This has certainly happened to me on a number of occasions, but imagine with me that you, uh, you're kind of going about your day, and maybe mid-morning, about this time, you go into the restroom. And as you go into the restroom and you look up, you all of a sudden see yourself in the mirror and you go, oh no, have I really gone, all, gone on all day so far looking like this? I don't know what it is. Maybe you missed a button, maybe a zipper's unzipped or your hair is disheveled or something stuck to you or you have a stain or, oh man, I forgot I wasn't supposed to wear this shirt. I don't know what it is. But at some point you walked in, you see yourself in the mirror and you just think, oh, well, quickly you fix yourself and you step out and you go about your day thankful probably for that mirror. But I want you to imagine the same scenario, only there is no mirror in the bathroom. For whatever reason, nobody's installed one. So you go right in, wash your hands, go right out. You never looked in a mirror because there wasn't one available to you, but you had that same issue. Now you're going to walk out just as oblivious as you walked in, right? Feeling great about your day, totally unaware that you actually look totally disheveled. And when you think about it that way, when you put it into that context, what you realize is that a mirror, what a mirror ultimately does is it communicates the truth about who we are. It tells us the truth about what's really going on. And what I have realized is it would be really great if we had mirrors all around us. We had people in our lives who were going, hey, have you checked this out? Or, hey, I saw you do this and I don't, I don't think you wanted to do that, right? Uh, it would be great if we had that. But the reality is we don't really. 
most people don't want to tell us the honest truth about ourselves. And this is why the most, the first kind of rule here, the first skill that students need to practice is the ability to tell the truth to themselves. They've got to possess their own mirror. They've got to be able to look at themselves and go, man, I was just a jerk to them. Why did I do that? People are not going to walk around and go, hey, you were just a jerk to me, right? That's not going to happen that often. I've got to learn to recognize that myself. Or, hey, I just did something and I felt totally alive while I was doing it. I think that I might have a passion in that area. I might have a strength in that area. I should really investigate that. Until we are aware of what's going on inside of ourselves, this is about our emotions. It's about how we react and how we handle certain scenarios, the strengths we possess, all of that stuff. Until we're able to recognize that, we can never actually fully walk around um, in, in, in a grounded sort of way. It's like walking around all the time with one of your buttons undone or with a zipper undone. Everybody else can see the thing, but you can't see it, which is why great young leaders are able to utilize a mirror. This is especially useful, I think, in today's world because of social media. A few years ago, in fact, it was early 2019, I heard the story of Essena. Essena O'Neill was a, um, uh, an Instagram star. I believe she had um, over half a million followers on Instagram. She was making about $100,000 every year from advertisements, you know, wearing certain clothes on Instagram. And she made news headlines in early 2019 because she uh, hopped on all of her social media accounts and she deleted well over half of her photos. And not only did she do that, she also then uh, recorded herself and uploaded to YouTube and her other social media profiles uh, a video of herself saying that, you know what, it's over for me. I'm not doing this anymore. It turns out that she had been absolutely miserable. Even though she had posted pictures like this of her smiling and wearing different outfits and looking all great and everybody's commenting and saying, you're so beautiful and all of this stuff, what she actually felt on the inside was completely different. She was telling herself and everybody else a lie ultimately about who she really was. For the photos that she left up, she came back and did what you see here. She came back and edited all the captions to tell the truth about what, what, this, what was really behind this photo. So what she said on here was, I took over 50 shots until I got the one I thought you might like. And then I edited this selfie for ages on several different apps just so I could feel social approval from you. There is nothing real about this. What I think ultimately happened is that Essena all of a sudden for real finally saw herself in the mirror and said, why am I doing all of this stuff? It's not actually adding any value to who I am. It's not helping me connect with the things I feel ultimately passionate about. It has nothing to do with anything that actually means something to me. It was like somebody had finally put a mirror up in front of her and she said, I hate everything about what I'm doing. A mirror, as I said, provides us the truth about ourselves. Like it or not, when we look into that mirror, we see things as they are rather than as we hope they will be. We cannot expect anyone else to tell us the whole truth about ourselves. And this is why we've got to learn to be our own mirrors. The mirror is called self-awareness. This is the skill that we often think of uh, when we think of self-awareness. Today, the reason I love this story so much is because today, Essena has gone from looking like this, the photo you see on the left, to looking like this. She actually just did a recent interview a couple of months ago, and she actually looks like a real human being now. How about that, right? Well, she did an interview because she had spent um, four years off of social media, and she had finally come back to social media and to the uh, wider world at large, and she had figured out who she was. She went off to university, she found some passion, she uh, was studying psychology, and she came back, started a new website. Uh, I think she called it Authentically Me, right? And what she did was she wrote about things that she was passionate about. She didn't have half a million followers anymore, but you know what she had realized? That's, that's not why I did it. That's not what matters to me. Having half a million followers doesn't, doesn't add to value to my life. Ultimately being who I am, recognizing my strengths and living into those helps me be who I fully actually am. I think Essena's story can be our student's story too. If they learn to be their own mirror, to practice the art of self-awareness and really truly see themselves as they are, see the strengths that are inside of them and live from those rather than from what other people might think about them. The second skill is a map. I want you to imagine with me um, that you were about to prepare a group of students to go on a hiking trip. 
Okay. So you're their leader kind of helping them get ready, but they're going to go on the trip without you. If you were to ask the question of what's the best way to get these kids ready, probably the natural inclination of many adults would be, well, I'm going to get the map out. I, I know how to navigate the world, right? I'm going to get a map out for them. I'm going to draw the course for them. And I'm going to say, here's where you're going to, you're going to camp here. And then you're going to stop here. And then you're going to go around this, right? And it may feel like that's the best way you can get them ready. It's sort of draw out the path. That's certainly the way we lead kids today, right? We tell them everything we think they should do in order to actually uh, be quote unquote successful, right? But if you think about it much longer than that, what you'll realize is uh, plotting out the whole thing for them is not actually the best way to get them ready because what happens if they're on this journey and all of a sudden that uh, route that you had planned doesn't work? Maybe there's an obstacle. Maybe they're going a little slower or a little faster than you anticipated. And it doesn't really make sense to follow things exactly as they are. Or worst case scenario, what if they get lost and they step off of that path that you had drawn out for them? It's in that moment, when you really think about it, you realize that the best way to get kids ready for an adventure like this is to actually hand them the map. Let them plot their own course. And if they plot their own course, then they're actually going to be more ready for the world they're entering into. This is called self-management. It's the ability to direct my own self, to set my own goals, to process my own discipline, to move in the direction and keep myself motivated towards that direction. Great leaders don't draw a map for their kids. They hand the map to their kids and they let them figure it out. There's another um, great story uh, associated with this. A young man named Norris, who I found out actually on Twitter, I found out about his story. He got caught by local police in his small Louisiana town. And when I say caught, it's got quotations around it because the local police had actually started a caught you program where they handed out tickets, but they weren't tickets for getting in trouble. They were tickets celebrating uh, young people, especially who had done something good. They wanted to, the police wanted to start celebrating not just the bad things that people were doing, uh, but actually start celebrating the good things that people were doing. Norris got caught because of what he was doing for his neighbors in his community. He was out for completely free of charge. He was out mowing their lawns. He would uh, narrowed in on specific people who needed more help. Um, people who were veterans who were a little bit old, people who had disabilities, elderly folks, single mothers who didn't have time to get out and mow their own lawns. Norris had been volunteering around his community to mow these lawns for them. And it was actually something that was inspired by uh, another man, a guy from on the a complete other side of the country who had started uh, a nonprofit called Raising Men Lawn Care Service. You can see him wearing the shirt there. And what Norris was doing was he was actually taking on a challenge called the 50 yard challenge. Uh, the leader of Raising Men Lawn Care Service was challenging young people all over the country to mow 50 lawns in their community for free. And that's exactly what Norris had just done. What I think is really great about this story, and I'll show you what happened as a result of it on the other end, but what I think is really great about this story is that what Raising Young Men Lawn Care actually did is they handed Norris a map. They said, okay, your goal is to get to 50 lawns. Uh, whose lawn you mow doesn't matter to us. Uh, how often you actually mow lawns doesn't matter to us. In fact, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to mow them because we're not giving you any lawn care stuff. This, it's a challenge. It's open. You got to figure it out. And this is a great truth of this map here. I've kind of talked about it, but let me read this for you. On a hiking trip, as in real life, the people going on the journey must be the ones to plot out the path. They must choose their destination and how they'll get there. The most important truth in preparing our students to navigate all the challenging choices of adulthood coming their way is that we cannot do it for them. This is called self-management. Well, Norris actually got a visit right after he got his caught you certificate. He got a visit from Rodney. Rodney's actually the founder of Raising Men Lawn Care Service. And what, Rod what Rodney does is whenever any student completes the 50 yard challenge, Rodney shows up with a whole brand new set of lawn care equipment so that they can keep it going. Uh, and that's exactly what he showed up and gave him that day. They also get the black t-shirt, which is why they're both wearing that 
uh, in the photo here as well. I love this because what ultimately Rodney challenged Norris to do was set a long-term goal. I didn't mention this. It took Norris four years to mow all 50 of those lawns between different summers over four years. And uh, that long-term goal that he was working towards for that four-year period ended up paying off. It paid off in the impact that he made. It paid off in the skills that he developed. It paid off in the uh, lawn care equipment that he earned. And it ultimately paid off because he had an even bigger goal than the 50 yard challenge. What he wanted to do with his life is he wanted to start his own lawn care service. And now he has the seed equipment in order to do that. I love that story. What a great example. Uh, the third uh, metaphor is a compass, a compass. Uh, we've talked about this many times at Growing Leaders, but if you think about the difference between a GPS and a compass, you'll understand the difference between a student who has the ability to direct themselves and one who doesn't. Most kids today are growing up in a GPS world, right? GPS gives you directions uh, no matter what conditions you're in, but there have to be a few situations that have to be met. The big one here is that you have to know where you are you have to know where you're going and there have to be paved roads in between. That's the only conditions in which a GPS is helpful. If you were to find yourself in the middle of the wilderness, for instance, and you possessed a GPS, it would basically be like a brick in your hands, right? It can't actually give you directions because it doesn't know where you are and it doesn't know how to get you to where you want to go. If you find yourself in territory that doesn't have paved roads, you're going to supremely wish that you had a compass. A compass points towards magnetic north, and it can give a young person direction no matter what territory that they're in. So what is a compass from a soft skill standpoint? I believe a compass is all about helping students point towards their own core values. Uh, ultimately, the compass is about responsible decision making, but I think the core of all great decision making comes down to, do I know who I am? Our values are ultimately the thing that we believe is going to be true about us no matter what situation we're in. In fact, that's how I help students figure out what their values are. I'll ask them a question like, if your best friend was asked to describe you in just a couple of words, what words do you hope they would use in order to describe you? Most of the time, the words that come to a student's mind those are their core values. Maybe it's kindness or wisdom or hard work or discipline or whatever it is. And what can happen is once they have those core values inside is even if they find themselves in a challenging situation, they're effectively in the wilderness of life. They can go, you know what? I don't know exactly what's happening here. I don't know exactly how I'm going to overcome this challenge, but here's what I can tell you. I decided a long time ago, I'm going to be kind no matter what situation I'm in. I'm going to be a hard worker no matter what situation I'm in. I'm going to be disciplined no matter what situation that is. And what, can, what happens is ultimately that compass is still giving them direction. It's helping them make responsible decisions, even in the face of challenging situations. It, it gives them constant direction. One of my favorite stories I came across of this is a young man named David Aguilar. David Aguilar is actually from Spain. And he was born uh, with a condition, it's called Poland syndrome. And what happens is in the womb, your, um, your digits, your arms and your legs uh, don't fully develop. In David's case, it was just one arm. His right arm didn't develop any uh, below the elbow, basically. And so David, at a very young age, came up with an idea. He was nine years old. He was like, what if I built my own arm? I love this. So at nine years old, he uses his Legos and builds himself an arm. It functions. He's actually able to use it without touching it with his other hand. He's able to use it to pick up different objects and things. Well, uh, he finally, once he gets older, a little older, he gets his hands on some stronger Legos. They're called Lego Technic. And he's able to build his second version where he actually is strong enough that he can do a push-up. So he can do push-ups for the very first time in his life because he's got this second arm. Well, in the years since... He's actually built five different prototypes, and his most recent one that he built, he calls it the Mark V, is actually, uh, he uploaded a video of him building it and then released all the designs online so that other people who have Poland syndrome or who have lost an arm uh, for various reasons can use it in order to build themselves their own arm. I think this is awesome. I would argue what David has is a compass, right? He knew who he was. By the way, it's not going to surprise you to know he is currently at university in Spain studying engineering. Anybody shocked by that? His goal is he wants to start a company that builds modern prosthetics 
for the future of the world for people who need them. Um, the compass he has inside of them, inside of him is driving him to build this. And what I love about this is just like a compass, a compass is designed to give you direction even when all other tools fail. For students who are soon to step out into the wilderness of adulthood, gaining a compass means they determine for themselves what their personal values, passions, goals, and ethics are, their own north. Once these core elements are determined, they provide direction for them in the face of any challenging situation. And that's why this is called responsible decision-making. Not only is ethics and values and all that a part of this, but so is critical thinking, evaluating different scenarios and problem solving is a piece of this too. So they use all of that stuff they have inside of them to give them direction in order to accomplish some of those really key tasks. Well, this story of David has a really amazing ending because uh, of all the people who were looking online at what David was doing, one of them was a mom, a mom a few countries away in Europe. And she had a young man, her son named Beckner, a little Beckner, I think he's about eight years old. He also has Poland syndrome, but rather than just be missing one arm like David is, he's actually missing all of his digits. He doesn't have any arms or legs. He kind of has different various appendages. And uh, his mom, Beckner's mom, reaches out to David and asks, hey, I saw this thing you built for yourself. Is there any way that you might could build something for my son? Well, that's exactly what David did. He used that internal compass that he had pointed in the direction he knew he needed to head. And what he did is he leveraged it not just for himself, but also for little Beckner. I want to show you this video is less than a minute, but it's the moment when Beckner tries on his new prosthetic for the first time. The joy on his face is palpable. I had to show it to you. So check this out. <laughs> Hey, Beckner. This is the MK Beckner. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see if it fits you. Okay. I thought about using okay. your right arm. Right arm. Yeah. And your left foot. Left foot. Just to see just... if it works. Can you try? Oh, oh, it works! Oh, it works! Oh, Yay! Wait, give me five. Sure. Well, give me two. <laughs> wait, what, uh, can I pick this up? Oh, 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 oh. Try again. Oh, this is super cool. It works. Yay! <laughs> Try and pick something smaller. Okay, um, so we'll get this thing. Oh. Yay! Oh, <laughs> it works perfectly. Yeah, and you know why? Because with Lego, everything is possible. <laughs> How awesome is that, man? I love that story. David clearly has a compass that's providing him direction for himself and for all the other people around him. All right, two more. I'm going to do these really quick. Uh, a two-way radio. Uh, you know how a radio works. You've seen one of these before. Uh, so here's a photo of somebody using one of these. Uh, a two-way radio is really easy to understand. There's two things you've got to do in order to use one of these correctly. First, You've got to be on the right channel with the person you're trying to communicate with, right? If you're on channel one and they're on channel three, it doesn't matter what you're saying or how well you say it, you're not going to get through to them. Are you on the right channel with them? And here's the second thing. Once you're on the right channel, you have to practice good etiquette, don't you? Because you can't talk and listen at the same time. And this is exactly true with how we build relationships. The first thing is we've got to learn how to get connected with other people, how to get on the same channel with them. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and it feels like they're talking to you as if you know what they're talking about, but you don't know what they're talking about. And they're clearly all about whatever they care about. And they're not considering at all that you have no context for what they're bringing up. You're immediately like, I don't want to have any more conversations with this person. They are lacking social awareness. They're lacking the ability to understand me and connect with who I am. What's happening ultimately is I think they're on the wrong channel. So one of the first things we have to do is teach kids how to recognize the person in front of them, understand that person, and then get on their wavelength, right? Get on their channel with them. And then after that's done, they've got to learn how to talk and listen. And the big, the big truth here is you can't talk and listen at the same time. Just like using a two-way radio, you say what you want to say, and then you stop and you listen to what they want to say back to you. In fact, not only that, but People who know how to use these radios have language in order to communicate, I'm done talking, right? They say over at the end of their communication. And what that says is, I'm not going to talk anymore. Instead, I'm listening to you. How well are our students able to communicate like this?
Uh, one school I heard about that's uh, learning the art of the two-way radio is Brogel Middle School. They're in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And uh, a few years ago, they actually had a complete transformation. 92% uh, of their students were from economically disadvantaged environments. And the challenges they were experiencing inside of the classrooms made it where the students were, um, their GPAs were really low, um, uh, uh, graduation rates or, you know, finishing middle school rates were not super great. They had tons of disciplinary instances. And what they did is they brought in a brand new system to utilize their quote unquote two-way radios. They started using a numerical system where they communicated by um, when a student walked in, they needed to communicate how they were feeling emotionally. They were increasing their emotional vocabulary, if you were. That's, that's a term that I talk about in the book. And what a student would do is as they were coming in, one of their teachers in the hallway would say, how are you today? And the student would give them a number and a word. The number communicated how I'm doing in terms of my emotions. 10 is really, really bad. One is really, really good. Okay, that's so I'm in a really good place. And so if a student walked by and said, I'm a three, then you know, great, we're in good shape. If a student walks by and says, I'm a six, then they might actually pull that student aside and say, hey, why don't we get some quiet time? We're going to move you to a quiet room and help you kind of process. Maybe you want to talk through some things. If a student says a seven or an eight, then they actually push, point them directly towards the school counselor where they're able to process what just happened. This came from a recognition that the, the staff at the school recognized that their kids are living in a constantly chaotic, hurtful, frightening sometimes environment. And they're often coming in and they're in survival mode. They just survived whatever they just came from and they came into school. And what they recognized is students are in a very different place as they enter in and they develop their own language in order to get on the same page about how each student is doing. The transformation there has been incredible. I'll tell you about it in just a minute. But this is the definition of the two-way radio. There are two important truths of using this two-way radio. You have to communicate on the same channel and you can't talk and listen at the same time. Just like learning to use the two-way radio, students must learn to communicate effectively in social interactions with others if they ever hope to thrive in real life. This is called relationship skills. Today, at Brogel Middle School, they've had a complete transformation, as I mentioned. After about two years, the number of failing students went from 12% to 7%. The number of discipline referrals dropped by 39%. And the average student GPA rose from 2.17 to 2.51. Also, their out-of-school suspensions dropped by 17%. And as all of the teachers and students were evaluating what happened, what they realized is we were going about our school day completely unaware of how everybody else around us was doing. We were disconnected. And as soon as they got on the same page, everything turned around. Such a great representation of why this skill is so important. Here's our last one. It's a passport. I don't know if you've been like me and spent any time around uh, or in different countries but it's really funny, if you ask me right now, I think I know where my passport is, but I can't be certain, right? Because as I'm in my home country, I don't really have to think about that, that, uh, that document. But when I go to a different country, it becomes the most important thing I possess. In fact, years ago, I spent a summer traveling around India. And while I was traveling around India, I made sure that every single day I had my passport around my neck in a little pouch underneath of my shirt because I thought I could have everything else taken from me, but I can't have that taken from me. It became an essential document. And I realized why after spending a whole summer in India, I realized that passport does two things. It first of all tells everyone around me and me who I am, where I come from my origin, right? All of us have, have an origin point. And I'm not just talking about our country. We have a family of origin. We have a personal history, all that stuff. The second thing the passport tells me is where I've been, right? It's got stamps in it. Those stamps in my passport say, here are the different places you visited, the different experiences that you've had. And I find that our social awareness, that's what this is all about, is based on those two elements. Who am I? Where do I come from? And what experiences have I been through? And what happens is those things contextualize the way I engage with the world around me. Uh, years ago, there was a young lady named Michaela, Michaela Ulmer, and she had uh, just such an experience. She was four years old, and like many young four-year-olds, she went outside and started her own lemonade stand in front of her house. Well, as she was getting ready for it, she was actually stung, ironically, by a bee because she used honey 
in her lemonade recipe. And she actually got stung by two bees in one week. And it made, it kind of threw her off from the whole thing. Well, her parents actually challenged her not to just be afraid of bees, but to instead investigate bees. What are these creatures and why did, why would they want to sting you and all of that? What happened was Michaela fell in love with bees. She was, became really passionate about uh, those creatures, what they can do, and most especially the challenges that they're facing. You guys know the honeybees are in deep trouble. And so Michaela actually uh, changed her recipe up a little bit, used a different kind of honey and started a, a, an organization from it with the passion to use the proceeds that she got from selling her lemonade to save the honeybee. What I think is that somebody helped her figure out her passport, right? She knew who she was. She had that core identity. She had the experience of getting stung by a bee. Her parents challenged her to turn that experience into action. And that's exactly what she did. Uh, the passport is a tool ultimately to help us orient ourselves in the world. And it's a document that's most useful when I'm in unfamiliar territory. When I'm in another country, my passport can tell others my identity, who I am, and my affiliation, what nationality I belong to, but also my history, where I've been. Just like owning a passport, students have to use their identity and experiences to contextualize their interactions with one another. This is, this is called social awareness. So Michaela launches her uh, lemonade. She calls it Me and the Bees Lemonade. I actually first found out about it because I was walking through Target one day. I saw this lemonade, picked it up, saw her picture on it, turned it around, read the story, and then went and looked this girl up because she is actually quite amazing. She has leveraged her lemonade empire now, sold over 5 million bottles, raised millions of dollars for uh, research helping to save the honeybee. And what she would say is all of it came from my uh, passion, that experience that I had getting stung by a bee, realizing the impact that I could make, and ultimately uh, turned it into her lemonade empire. She actually even wrote a book about it called Be Fearless, uh, which I really love. One of her statements she always says is, there is always help back at the hive. And indeed, I think that could be true for all the kids that we're leading today, if we were able to lead them really, really well. Ultimately, if your students are going to be ready for real life, it will be because you got them ready. This uh, whole adventure, this uh, whole conversation that we're having, these five skills that we're talking about are the core ingredients that student, students need. If these five uh, metaphors, these five skills are in their pack, that's why I'm using this backpack everywhere, is the idea is like you're taking these five skills, you're putting them in their pack and you're saying, you know what, you're ready to go now. Take off and you're gonna be able to change the world. If we give these skills to our students, I think it's gonna transform them. Well, I can't wait for you to get your hands on this book. I'm gonna end our time here uh, together. I can't wait for you to get your hands on this book. This, this uh, pre-order is gonna launch really, really soon. I have been informed by my colleagues in the room that the number you see on your screen is actually wrong. It's not 57101, it's 75101. I believe that's already in the chat. If you missed that, if you happen to miss that, you're texting the word ready to 75101, 75101. So I would just um, challenge you, send that text, stay in touch with us. This book's gonna go live really, really soon. The pre-order is gonna happen on Amazon. So you're gonna be able to buy it really easily just like you do uh, everything else. I can't wait for you to get your hands on this book. I sincerely hope it's a helpful resource. It is certainly gonna be chock full of stories of young people doing amazing stuff. And I hope that you're challenged to prepare your own students for real life by giving them these five essential tools, these five essential skills. All you gotta do is text that word ready to the number 75. 101. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Sorry, I went about five minutes over on our, our uh, pre-designed webinar time, but I am so honored that you've chosen to spend some time here uh, with me today. Can't wait for you to get your hands on this resource. If you want to reach out to us, please feel free to do that. I'll hang around for about five minutes here uh, after the webinar is over if you have questions or uh, anything else. But again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Can't wait for this book to get out uh, and we'll see you again soon. I've been told Krista had a question about, was there a slide you wanted to see again?
we did record this for those of you wondering, and we can send it out for sure. Appreciate everyone's qu uh, kind words. Somebody asked about Audible. I was just going to let everybody know this is coming out in print. It's coming out in Kindle, and it's also coming out in Audible. So there will be an audio book as well. Uh, all of it will be via Amazon. So if you bought a resource there, you will be able to get it for sure. And it should you should have no problem buying it in any country as well. Okay, we'll send out the recording for sure. Yeah, the recording is going to go live. Rachel's teaching her first habitude. All right. Love it. Love it. Keep it up, Rachel. Rooting for you. You guys are great. This is so fun. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Appreciate that. I hope it goes really well with your with your teachers. I think any educator is going to find this to be a helpful resource, especially if there's some confusion around what is this whole soft skill thing? That was one of my goals is to try and make it as simple and easy to understand as possible. So I certainly hope it's helpful, Jill. Molly, how are you sending out the recording? Sam just asked about that. Um, yeah. I will be posting it to YouTube, but also sending the link in the chat. Okay, cool. So the link to the recording is going to go, it's, we're actually going to post it on YouTube. So you'll be able to find it there. But then also we will, um, we'll be sending it out through the text, the same text channel that you uh, texted there. So if you hopped on that, text the word ready to 75101, you will, um, you will also get access to that recording. So Danny asked about the um, the five metaphors. Um, one of them is also a habitude, which is the compass. Um, the others, we do have a habitude called the mirror effect, but it teaches a little bit different principle. So these would be um, these would be separate from habitudes, but really kind of pushing people towards habitudes. So. Um, age for this content, it's really, I think it's great for any adult who's leading the next generation. I do think there's a lot of young people who would read this and find it quite interesting as well, as long as they were uh, a little more self-aware. Um, okay, we got specific questions. So this is the mirror. It's actually, Krista, it's a mirror. Um, that's the one for that. And then I'll say the map one in just a second. So that is the mirror one. And this is the map one. Hopefully that got you what you wanted. All right, folks. Well, I'm going to head on out. Um, thank you guys so much for joining today. Be in touch. Texts are coming to you soon. Can't wait for you to get your hands on this book. I can't wait for it too. It's going to be awesome. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.